Welcome to our podcast, Stuff with Steve, and I'm Steve Hill, the senior pastor at Grace Community Fellowship here in Eugene, Oregon. I'm joined by Nick, our producer of the podcast. And hey, Nick, we're going to talk about civil disobedience today. And have you ever been part of a protest before of any kind? No, I haven't, but they sure do look like fun. I think it depends where and what kind of protest you're involved in. And so that's what we want to talk about today, civil disobedience. When is it right for Christians to rebel against the government? And it's a hot-button topic today because some churches are rebelling against authorities, and one church is fined a million dollars in Southern California, and then other churches have taken other approaches and sued the government. So... We have that going on. We also have protests in Portland and the Capitol and other places. And so we just have the civil unrest and civil dis- disobedience. So with that, at my age, I'm 58, and I'm not really um, old enough to know about the riots and protesting in the 60s with the Vietnam era. Uh, but I have been around enough to see protests against abortion clinics and things like that. So I think what we need to approach all of these issues as followers of Jesus is simply this. Uh, How can I have a – what does the Bible inform me concerning civil disobedience? So I have this uh, illustration, and it's probably a dumb one, but it just makes me mad. In fact, just talking about it right now, I'm getting worked up already. It's that I wear contact lenses, and every time I need to go buy new contact lenses, I have to have an up-to-date prescription. And I, it has to, it can, I have to have a, an eye exam every 12 months and shell out 100 bucks for my eye exam. And I'm thinking, my eyes have not changed. Why are they telling me I have to have an eye exam? And it just frosts me. I figure that some state representative was an optometrist and said, hey, it'd be a good law and it'd make us a lot of money to require people to get their eyes checked every year instead of every three years or something. And we can make some money off that. So... So it just frosts me, right? I think it's dumb. I think it's stupid. But yet the Bible tells me I need to follow the governmental laws. So I have that tension, right? The tension, I think, is simply this. Personally, we think something is dumb, or I'm going to take it a step further. There are times that things are evil, and that's a different issue, very different. Things are evil. There's an evil law that's oppressing or hurting people, and that's different from what the contact lens thing I just shared. So that's very different. But some of the key passages would be like in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, Peter is writing in about early 60s AD. Nero is in charge of the Roman Empire, very brutal dictator. Peter says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether an emperor as the supreme authority or the governors, and he goes on, that they're there to punish wrongdoing. Well, that's a significant passage, and and it's several verses that he talks about this civil unrest and civil uh, how we should obey the governing authorities. Paul the Apostle said the same thing in Romans 13, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. So we have passages like this in Scripture, a couple of them. In fact, there's one that's very similar in Titus that Paul writes too. So we have this tension between I need to obey the governing authorities, but but how do I respond when the laws are oppressive or morally evil, something like that. This has been a, an issue for 2,000 years as Christians have engaged government, the government. I have been in countries where the government persecutes people, where the government may persecute Christians. I had a pastor in Southeast Asia tell me that his home was pelted by rocks because he had a Bible study in his house, or 
They're very careful not to post things on social media about following Jesus because it could make their lives difficult. Uh, I have friends in other countries, I'm thinking of Asia, who have very difficult lives because of government persecution. So how do we respond to these to these issues? Because often as Americans, we have a filter, but yet people in other countries have a different filter about these as well. I was uh, reading this week about civil disobedience, and one of the names that frequently gets brought up is Henry David Thoreau. And uh, Nick, do you know anything about Henry David Thoreau? I mean, in my thinking about Henry David Thoreau, it brings me back to honors English, and I'm really trying to browse my brain, but to the best of my ability, I remember Henry David Thoreau being a man who wanted to stand up against the government, against anyone overruling him, and just went out into the forest and lived there and wrote some beautiful literature. Yeah, yeah. So Thoreau was this guy, he lived in the 1840s, and... Yeah, moved out to Walden Pond. Walt Whitman wrote about that as well. But uh, Thoreau wrote frequently about disobeying the government. And people who are anarchists, who are kind of against everything, often lift up Thoreau as one of their heroes. So Thoreau thought the poll tax was bad and evil and slavery. He, He was an abolitionist. Abolitionist means they wanted to abolish slavery. And so... Uh, Thoreau was spot on with those things, and he refused to pay the poll tax and went to jail for it. And then the sheriff wanted to pay it for him, and he refused to let him. And then apparently one of his relatives paid it so he could get out of jail, and which I think made him mad. He wanted to be there to make a statement as well. And, and Thoreau approached civil disobedience as a secular humanist, and not from the perspective that we have about Christ and Scripture, and so that that's Thoreau's story, and, and it came to fruition even a hundred years later as people grappled with uh, the government. But one of the overriding questions that we must ask is uh, simply, who decides what is right? Yeah, is that is that left to my own human heart? I, I may not decide correctly what is right. Even the American Revolution, theologians grapple with this: should the colonists have kicked King George out. I mean, he was the governing authority. He was the emperor, the king. And we're told to pray for the king, and yet they're kicking him out. And so it's it's an issue to wrestle with. You know, was that was that okay for them to do? Now, some would say it was okay because uh, the lower government officials thought that they were being persecuted and treated unjustly and oppressively. And there's a, it gets complicated, but, but in essence, they believe that they should shun uh, King George, those government officials, because of his, his, because of his actions. Now, some people would say if a law is unconstitutional, we should disobey it. But that also brings us back to the question: Well, who decides if it's unconstitutional? I mean, at one point, you had the Supreme Court in the Dred Scott case in 1858 saying that. Black people were what three fifths human. I mean, I mean, so they decided, and they were wrong. Well, who decides if something is unconstitutional? Sometimes theologians grapple with these things, and what they present sometimes is that violence is only okay as a last resort, and some would say violence is never okay. And I think we see that with with Martin Luther King, that that violence is not okay, and we're going to march and protest and use all legal means and court cases um, as well, uh, and just go down, you know. And that that was that was the approach uh, uh, then. I think it's helpful to understand a couple things at this point. One is that we have dual citizenship. I belong to Jesus, but I also want to be a good citizen of the country I live in, and obey the laws. I'll ask this question, and Nick, you don't have to answer, but have you ever been speeding? You know what, Steve? I actually would love to answer that question. Uh, <laughs> one time, not not so long ago, I was driving home from a wedding, and I was going 40 and a 30 and did not realize it and got pulled over by the police officer who is tailing me so sneakily in the dark. And it was not a proud moment of mine, 
but I did get off with a warning. So Oh, you I'm, got off. I'm grateful for you that. You got off. Wow. Did did you cry? Is that how you got off or No, I oh, just okay. went into ultimate polite mode. You see, if we're to obey the laws, you know, we should prob- we should obey traffic laws, right? Whether we get caught or nothing is not the point. We should obey those things and over the years I've probably had 10 speeding tickets in my lifetime, all of them before the age of 25. Yeah. And so I even got a ticket for drag racing. How's that? I forgot to say that to you. But anyway, so uh, we should obey those laws, even the ones we don't like as, as well. But I'm a dual citizen as well. So some people, when it comes to civil disobedience, are there examples in the Bible of this? And I think there are a couple. One in Acts chapter 4 where Paul or where Peter and John are told, quit preaching the gospel. And the people who are telling them that are the Sanhedrin, the ruling Jewish party. And the ruling Jewish party had authority over the temple area. The Romans controlled uh, the city of Jerusalem, but the Romans always allowed the the countries that they conquered allowed local officials to still conduct business. So the Sanhedrin, the ruling Jewish party, told them to quit it, and they said, you know, we're not going to stop talking about Jesus. So they disobeyed there. So I think that's an example of civil disobedience. Another one is Daniel in uh, the Old Testament where he is told, don't pray to your God. And you pray to pray to our God, pray to the statue of, uh, of uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Well, Daniel refuses that and gets tattled on and ends up in the lion's den, right? there, he He is there, but he chose to disobey that. Now, I think the reason he chooses to disobey is because he is compelled to do something morally wrong. There are all these examples in the Bible about civil disobedience. I would say there's a handful, and one is the killing of innocent babies by Pharaoh. So they make the command that these children should be murdered, and the Jewish midwives and mothers uh, refuse to do so. Now, what's interesting to that a couple things. One is that where that's the story of Moses, right? But the other thing is that they didn't rally a march and try to overthrow Pharaoh and the Egyptian government. They just refused to do what he said. Is what they did. So we have that example. We have the prophets of Baal, the prophets of Yahweh, God, who fighting Jezebel, the prophets of Baal, and they refused to bow down to Baal, and it cost them their lives. But there was a refusal to obey the the government and the governing authorities. So we have the example of John and Peter refusing to uh, stop talking about Jesus. We have those who refuse to bow down to Pharaoh or to get involved in idolatry and the innocent babies and stuff. And I think in my mind, there's a difference between disobeying bad laws and disobeying laws that compel us to do evil. And as Christians, we need to be aware of those laws. So I think of it this way, that does the law permit evil to happen or does it compel me, command me to do something morally wrong? So let's take the abortion issue, for instance. I believe I'm pro-life. I believe life begins at conception and that life should be protected and that with abortion laws, it's permitting evil to happen. It's not compelling me to do that. The abortion issues in China were different, where they were, they were forced to have abortions in China. So that's, that's different, different thing. So we have, does it permit or does it command? Uh, does it uh, oppress politically or does it oppress uh, religiously, let me put it that way. And I think that's a difference as well. Is it, is it commanding me not to worship God? And I think in that framework, we need to be civil disobedient. Now, the question that, that comes up is simply this, how do I disobey? I mean, I think that's critical because in times past, some people would uh, kill abortion doctors, blow up buildings, Uh, We could probably reach back for other examples of violence, and I think as believers, we're not called to that. We're called to exercise every way that we can to remedy the situation without doing that. Here's my biblical example of that. Paul the Apostle was a Roman citizen, and he used his citizenship as a tool 
to further the gospel. So when it comes to civil disobedience, I think we need to have the same framework that Paul, as Paul did, we want to use our rights, our citizenship, to exhaust every avenue for change. And that may take years to do as well. And Paul made an appeal to Caesar when he caused a riot in Jerusalem. So he spends a couple years in house arrest um, in Caesarea on the sea, uh, 50 miles from Jerusalem, and then he appeals to Caesar, and they take him all the way to Rome. Well, all of this appealing is actually some benefit because the gospel is going to spread to Rome because of Paul's presence there. But my point is simply that he used his citizenship as a tool, and I think often we need to think of things in the same way. That's why we have court cases often. You know, sometimes those court cases, you know, we don't agree with the outcome, but then we have to ask the question, is it compelling me, forcing me to do evil personally, or is it not? And then the question, how to disobey, that's why people do lawfully protest in our country, hold signs, march, um, those things as well, file legal lawsuits, try to persuade people to do the right thing. And I see a lot of room for that in our lives, that we persuade people to do the right thing. Often I think of it this way, that we can give moral arguments for our society to do the right thing, but in in the end, it'll be love and action. That will really make a difference because governmental laws probably don't change people's hearts, but as we love people and show them grace and do all that we can to do what is right, I think that is what eventually changes human hearts as well. So those are some thoughts that I have about civil disobedience and just making those clarifications that we have examples in the Bible of civil disobedience, but we also need to have a framework that we use our citizenship to point people to the gospel and we try to use it for good. As long as the government does not force me to do something morally wrong or force me to commit an evil act, then I need to have that framework and to be able to be aware of those two distinctives. Force on one hand, or the government simply allow evil to happen as well. So those are some of my thoughts today about civil disobedience. As we apply those in our culture, it's going to look different every time. But I think we need to be careful and think through who decides if it's evil and how are we going to respond and disobey evil laws that perhaps may compel us to do things that are not morally right. Hey, grace to you today and peace with you this week. And we'll be talking to you next time on Stuff with Steve.